Time for Type 40, your Doctor Who podcast from the Spacebook for the Fandom Podcast Network with me, Dan Hadley, Birmingham's King of the Geeks and your designated driver. Whether you're new to the show, to the entire time stream, or whether you've been here before, you'll be happy to learn with still the same irreverent, non-gatekeeping, eclectic show for everybody. Whatever decade or century you started watching, reading, or listening along to the timeless adventures of our hero, Doctor Who, we chat about it all on this show. All views are encouraged, and there'll even be a laugh or two along the way. So come and step into our TARDIS and share this journey here with us on Type 40. Hello. Yes, here we are again in the secondary control room. Let's go full 70s this time. 70s, and I think it's mahogany. It's not I don't think it's oak, is it? I know somebody who will know, and probably knows the finish, and even knows the kind of brushes it was painted with. Yes, it's, uh, oh God, I was about to say it was a 70s survivor. I'd better get him on before I insult him anymore. Yes, it's my good friend, the original lunatic, Simon Horton. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, Dan. Yeah, I don't remember the 70s at all. No, I'm far too young to remember the 70s. Um, yeah, it's mahogany. It is mahogany finish. But but of course, it's not mahogany. There's absolutely no mahogany anywhere near that set. It was all it was all the MDF painted um, and, and vinyl cover and vinyl wrap what? and the like. Cover the children's <laughs> ears. We don't need to. Next Next, you'll be telling me about the tough fairy. I'm not, I'm not prepared to handle, <laughs> handle that again. I go, well, I love this console room. I've always loved it. And me too. it brings to mind to me, Simon, not just the 1970s, but it's got a, a texture to it, hasn't it? It's it's tactile. It feels like you could you could throw yourself down in a big armchair and open the book of your of your choice. Usually a Doctor Who book when it's when it's us, isn't it? How is that for a link? <laughs> that is a good link. That is very smoothly done, Dan. <laughs> it looks it looks like a library, yes. And, and most Doctor Who fans, we do have libraries, don't we? Of oh, essential, yes. essential books that have uh, gradually been published throughout the decades because Doctor Who has been it's <laughs> Doctor Who's been in print for almost as long as it's been on the TV, isn't it? Oh, that's it. Make me feel really, really old now. Why don't you? <laughs> We're on a roll, everybody, on a roll. <laughs> but yes, I mean, the, the very first Doctor Who books, weren't they in, in the shops like 18 months to two years after the show debuted, something like that? Yeah, yeah. The very first one, which was Doctor Who in an exciting adventure with the Daleks, written by David Whittaker from Terry Nation's uh, first seven-part Dalek serial. Yeah, that appeared, I think, within about a year, 18 months, something like that, after first transmission, um, and then followed very quickly by the Crusades. Uh, well, the Crusaders, as it was released, and uh, and uh, the Zarbi, uh, following on from Bill Strutton's The Web Planet script. Those were the first three books, and they were print they were printed published. Yeah, not long after after transmission. Um, it was a blaze of glory, but then yeah. things went a little quiet for a while. It was it was baby steps, wasn't it? Before we we got an entire range of Doctor Who novelizations that that uh, gradually trickled out, didn't they? From nineteen seventy three on was through the rest of the 70s and through the 1980s they were famously they were a breeding ground weren't they for young readers lots of Doctor Who fans and I think lots of kids generally still talk about that that line of books from Target WH w. Allen was the publisher and Target was the imprint wasn't it that's right I think 
That's right. And W. H. Allen were the hardback uh, copies, um, or Alan Wingate. Some of them went out under, I think. Um, but that, but I, I, yeah, I mean, Doctor Who fans of that of that era definitely. Just about every one of them will tell you that they learned to read pretty much as a result of of reading these Target yeah. books. Um, the, 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 you know, the, the impact of these books can't be overemphasised. Um, they were huge back in the day. They were on every on every bookshelf in every Smith's or John Menzies or even your local news agent would would carry them. Um, I remember I remember seeing the Web of Fear uh, in in a, a chemists of all places back in the day. Um, they were everywhere. They were ubiquitous. <laughs> uh, what well, books were ubiquitous, weren't they? When I look back. Yeah. Now, now you mention it, card shops, petrol stations, everybody, all these places, they all sold, sold paperbacks, didn't they? Yeah. And it could be kids' books or Mills and Boone kind of books, and they'd be in little card outers. Wouldn't, they would line yeah, or the one shelves of those, with one of those revolving wire stands. Those, do you remember those tall revolving wire stands? Yeah, I do. Yeah, yeah. In fact, I, used to, I think I used to get my Target books from one shop in particular. They used to be, they used to be on there. All, the, all these memories. When, when the world was a lot larger, but stores were a lot lot smaller and on every street corner but yeah when we when we look at doctor who books and we we think about the the imagery that burnt itself into our minds and, and uh, stayed with us for decades afterwards there are several there are several eras of those books aren't there you know the broken down usually usually denoted by what's on the cover they say you can't judge a book by its cover <laughs> but human beings, yeah, we are we are very visual creatures aren't we and so we we do tend to and fortunately for for doctor who as a as i think as a franchise as a publishing line i don't think any line of books has been served better with its cover artists and it all started it all started with these three books these three reissues weren't they in 1974 75 73, 73 i think um yeah those are the three reissues and it's interesting because when they when these books originally came out in hardback and then in paperback um i think it was uh, was it green lion that printed uh, the crusaders there, there were various imprints of them but they all had very ropey covers and it's interesting not one of them sold they didn't sell well which is why when wh allen started and they needed some cheap books they were able to buy these three titles uh from the original publishers very very cheap because they just hadn't sold so wh allen bought them for, for next to nothing and put these these covers on them and the rest is history literally it's as simple as that they so went the like hot lion proper started with doctor who and the daleks doctor who and the crusaders and doctor who and the zabi all coming out again in paperback form at, at pocket money friendly prices but crucially for this conversation brought to life with these incredible distinctive timeless covers and cover artwork from the artist chris akaleos now and that's what we're here to talk about this time aren't we yeah, and, and I, do you know, I don't think I'd ever get bored of talking about Chris Akeleos's <laughs> artwork. And, you know, the guy is a legend. Um, I, I, we, we can't overemphasize this enough. We just love his artwork. Uh, it's really, really important for, for, for Doctor Who fans of a certain age, of which, Dan, you and I are of that age. Um, you know, and, and, and the guy really is, is right up there. He, he's, his artwork is part of my childhood. And I still remember getting those books. And at the time, I didn't know, I didn't know who Chris Akileos was. I just remember getting the books. And every so often, you'd get tucked in a tiny little corner of one of the covers, just the word Achilleos. And I used to, well, in the day, we used to think it was Achilleos. We didn't know there was an accent over it and that he was, he, he, he was Cypriot <laughs> by birth. Um, and, and I used to think, what is Achilles? What does that mean? I didn't know as a 10 year old what that meant. And so he's, you know, he's literally part of my childhood from right, right back when, <laughs> when we all discovered those Target books for the first time. See, I know he doesn't take offence. If you if you are watching or listening, Chris, I know you don't take offence. But I do make ever since we spoke to, we spoke to the gentleman last year. I do make every effort to make sure that I do pronounce his name. It, maybe he's maybe he views his brand and his name and his actual personal identity is two separate things I don't know, Chris, <laughs> but i do make every effort to pronounce his name properly now that i know the difference but yes uh these three books came out and they were hugely successful leading to a whole line and lots 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 more 
amazing pieces of artwork from Chris. And they became, over a period of those first few years, they were snapped up by, ch by children, weren't they, in bookshops or wherever, and used as a sort of back backdrop, I suppose, as a way of reliving the adventures that you'd seen on the television, or maybe even the episodes that you had that you'd missed, either because they were before your time, or you'd been like taken out to the shops or whatever else by those irritating creatures known as parents. You know, so it was a way of chronicling Doctor Who. And in many ways, you could say that Chris Ecclesiastes made it look better than ever, didn't he? <laughs> Well, undoubtedly, um, the, 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 some of the covers are, are true to be said better than the better than the stories that they that they represent. Um, but you're right, Dan. In that, certainly in my case, I was experiencing stories. I, I suddenly, when I first found these target books, I suddenly discovered an entire new world uh, laid out at my feet that I didn't even know existed um because back in the in those days when i when i first found target books i was probably around about nine ten maybe at the oldest um and i had no idea at that point that there'd even been um a, a doctor other than john pertwin tom baker as far as i knew that was it it was just john pertwin tom baker that were the two doctors um and the very very first book i i, I the very very first target book i read um, was the tenth planet, and it was in hardback. Um, and th this is this is one of the. Um, it's not the actual hardback, unfortunately, that I had from my own local library. But there is the date stamp, and it's from Derbyshire County Library. This one, um, but this is it. This was the book that I saw on a shelf in a library in, as I say, round about nineteen seventy-seven. I would guess seventy-eight, maybe. And my literally, my world changed because I didn't know these books existed until I just stumbled across one. And at this point, I was obsessed with Doctor Who. So to suddenly find a book about Doctor Who, it was all your Christmases had come at once. But this goes with both the things you're what you're saying, Dan. Because to say, I didn't even know what Doctor they were talking about in this book. Yeah it doesn't really make it clear so i couldn't i didn't know who the doctor was didn't know who ben and polly were i didn't know what all this business was about okay. regeneration at the end so that was that was i was discovering <laughs> and this went for so many of the target books i discovered stories i didn't know anything about i didn't even know they existed purely because i discovered the target book but also what you were saying is the covers were often better than the stories and let's be honest that cover which still for me is one of my favorite Chris Akeleos pieces of artwork. That looks way better than anything that, that, that you well, see on the screen in 66. Like all commercial art, as it used to be called then, you know, illustration, it's, it's artwork that as pretty as it, as it is, is there to, uh, to meet a purpose, isn't it? It's to, to make you want to buy it. And I don't, th I don't think any artwork could compel you more. It's so vibrant. It says two two things on two levels. I must have that on my bookshelf so I can continue to look at this beautiful artwork. And, and second, and secondly, it's what is happening in that story. I have to find out what is happening yeah. there. It's so yeah. evocative, so stimulating, and so stark, and so the style of the artwork as well is so distinctive and that is that is something that was deliberately fashioned by chris himself wasn't it techniques and balance uh, of tone and color beginning with his very first cover when he when he came to uh, to cover still the, one of the reissue of doctor who and the daleks and yeah he was sort of feeling his way as he went along uh, and the choice the choice the balance there that perfect balance and even how classic standards like such uh, characters such as the daleks were interpreted he took artistic license but in such a tasteful way he seemed to have this innate internal perfect judgment of where to blur the lines between what we'd seen on screen and what was in the mind what was in the memory and as and as, as Chris always says, he, he was thinking from the readership point of view. He knew it was kids that were reading these. Chris himself loved comic books, so he was bringing that comic book sensibility to the table. Uh, and and he was making decisions 
with in the full awareness of what he thought the kids would like not necessarily yeah. what the publisher would like yeah, not yeah, what yeah. you and i would like as grown-ups but what kids would like and in that respect he was spot on every single time you know you look at these behind me here and it's that graphic style again this is for, for, from from the web planet um it, the web planet on television is nothing compared with the artwork that just leaps out at you it pops out at you and as you say says buy the, buy this book read this book because it just looks so exciting and he had you're right chris has that way of doing it i think that uh, last year simon and i were lucky enough to speak to chris we spent an whole afternoon in chris's company through through the wonders of modern, of modern we technology could, we could still be talking now to be honest it was a fascinating conversation it, it was an incredible conversation. It was in, enlightening and it was very, he was very, very generous with both his time and with his memories. And, and what I came away with from after we spoke to him was the fact that this is a man who, even though he was an adult, when he painted those covers, and, and obviously now, several decades on, you know, it's, it, he's decades further into this incredibly distinguished and prolific career in fantasy artwork this is somebody who is still very very youthful in his outlook he's still very much in touch with that inner child and that boyhood love and and stimulation that he had from from the entire world around him from history from from books and from from story from mythology and all these things all these things were in the mix and I think I think that's something that's still true of children children today. But when you when you speak to when you speak to him, not just about his craft, but about story and about film and, and every other kind of popular culture, the man's eyes just start to start to spark. You see his enthusiasm there, can't you? It's all all the things that were cultivated in us as as readers and as people gazing upon this artwork. You know, I think it comes. It's mainlined from the imagination. Of Chris Akaleos. <laughs> and over those years, I collected those books painstakingly. I know you did too. We were far oh, from yes. alone. An entire generation of children did. And we would do that thing where we would tile, tile the living room carpet with all the covers from all the books over a period of time and gaze in wonder the way yeah. that people may, maybe successive generations have done that with VHS and with David, I, I don't know, perhaps they have, but I, I think, I think maybe in the ear of the target books, because there was, because there was nothing else, there was that what was on the page and our imaginations and memory, I think it was a much, uh, a shorter distance and to, to reach out and touch them, to lay them down with your own hand. It's yeah, it, you just amazing I, memories. I, I, I agree. I, I think, uh, the, the thing with the target books is that as i say the first three were released the pre the pre-target books were released and, and let's not forget they were released at the height of, of 60s doctor who popularity and they still failed to find an audience so i, I think the truth of the matter is that without chris akileos's artwork on those books i question how popular they would have been you you know you could write a thesis on <laughs> the extent to which Chris Akileos secured that that range, the, the 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 success, the commercial success of that range, and I think it's huge. We 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 credit Terence Dix obviously with the contents that we love dearly, but I honestly feel that without those covers, I just don't know that they would have leapt out of the uh, from the from the shelves in the same way that they did. And I don't know whether they would have connected with an audience in the same way that they did. So this is why you can't, you, you, Chris Akileos is, is probably partially responsible for the success of the show as well, because at that point that the book started to be published, Doctor Who was moving into a golden era of, of popularity. And so again, how much of it is tied up with, with the success of the target range and thus how much of the target range success is tied up with Chris Akileos's artwork? They're all intrinsically linked. And so what I'm saying in the roundabout way is, you know, Chris is there. He's right there in the mixing pot of Doctor Who's success from, from that golden era, as far as I'm concerned. Highly influential figure. And what I en enjoy as well, you know, particularly in hindsight, we do these things in, hi in hindsight, when you see later pieces of artwork, both both for the book covers themselves or promotional items for, for several of the other titles that would that would roll out as long as Chris was on the range. You saw a man 
flexing his creative muscles, developing those techniques, trying different things, being being extravagant in some ways, pushing it as far as maybe the publisher would would allow, I don't know, and being playful, and being playful too, and being and creating iconic images that have kind of got a life of their own, I think, away, away from the TV stories and away from the target line itself, because yes, here we are in 2021, and a lot of these designs, they live on as t-shirts, as mobile phone cases, and a number of other merchandise from Chris Akalos himself over, over on his website. And you're the proud owner of several such items, are you not? I sorry? am. I've got lots of the prints. I've bought loads and loads of prints. I'm wearing my Day of the Daleks t-shirt today. I've got another one for the Ice Warriors upstairs. I've got a couple of mugs. Here I am enjoying my coffee out of the Auton Invasion and the Claws of Axos. And these are beautiful, beautiful items. If anybody, you know, is tempted by them, I would say grab them because the quality of them, the, 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 the mugs are just beautiful. You can't really tell from this, but they, they, they are phenomenal quality. The printing on them is magnificent. The prints are great. You know, go and go and go and dip in to the treasure trove that is the Chris Akileos website. Um, you, you you will be, I can't imagine you won't be tempted to buy something. Um, it, it's a fantastic collection of, of merchandise that he's put together and, and good on him. You know, the, the one question I would say is why did it take so long for this stuff to come out? Because we've all been waiting for this stuff for decades. Um, um, so I'm just pleased that it's finally out there. You can you can go and treat yourself to some Chris Akileos memorabilia, artwork, whatever. And all the links will be in the show notes and the description of both the podcast and the video going forward with this because we know you're going to need to know where to find this. But I think the, uh, yes, the better late than never mantra, <laughs> yeah. it's, it, it couldn't be more appropriate, both in, in, the, in terms of the range we've just been talking about and specifically the one item which we're going to show some real love to over the next 20, 30 minutes. So yes, as the line rolled out and all this artwork were expanded and accumulated, it created a, a portfolio of work that despite you know, Chris Akaleos, he moved on from Doctor Who, a successful line of art books based on yeah. all manner of fantasy art and historical art. There's movie posters. The, the man has had this illustrious career. But we know, whoever you are in the creative field, if you touch Doctor Who and Doctor Who touches you, it never really leaves you. And so this has sort of gone parallel to, to the man's main career, to his ongoing career, this association with Doctor Who. And I, th I think that over the years as well, the Doctor Who publishing line has continued and it evolved from the paperbacks we were talking about to the big sort of coffee table books, didn't it, in both hardback and in paperback, that we as as those children who would later be, uh, become adults and wanted to know the, the minutiae of, of Doctor Who, behind the scenes things, or just to celebrate certain angles of it. So we've got a whole line of books about each individual decade of the show's production, for example. There's there's Doctor Who art books, there's Doctor Who cookbooks, there's all manner of, of large format Doctor Who books. But I think that over time, even though there have been other art books and other visual celebrations of the show that included fan art and all the rest of it, I think there is there is one book that was conspicuous by its absence and has been probably for the last 20, 30 years. And that's a and in a collection, a complete or as near as could as near as could be complete collection of all of Chris Akaleos's Doctor Who related artwork. It's such a simple idea. It's such an easy sell. That how on earth has it taken all these decades for this to finally happen? Because yes, one has been published. It was it was published late last year, wasn't it, Simon? Yeah. And this this is what we're talking about. This is Clack. The Doctor Who art of Chris Akaleos from Candy Jar Books. At last, I think it was announced around two to three years ago, wasn't it, by Candy Jar? Yeah. And they've taken their time putting this title together. I think the reception to the original announcement probably said it all. The, the weight of history, the, uh, the sense of occasion around this, 
and the enthusiasm and commitment from from Chris himself. Because when when we spoke, to him, I think it's in lots of other interviews that he's given, the impression I got was very very clear that he himself, even though he's a very modest man, that this is something that he wanted. That this was long overdue. Yeah, I think so. You're right in that he's a very, very modest man. He's very self-effacing. Um, he's there, there isn't a, an ounce of ego, it seems, within him. Uh, he he seems very humbled by the reception that his artwork still gets. Um, and so maybe that's one of the reasons why we've waited so long for this book, because almost he didn't. I, I think this is probably fair to say. I don't think he quite appreciated, realised the, the, the value that people put on his artwork. Um, how much how much people loved it um and and so i think it, it, to an extent it's sort of taken him by surprise this the, the the adoration that his artwork now attracts um but you're right this book is long overdue we should we certainly should have had this about 20 or 30 years ago but it doesn't matter it's here now and you know it has to be said it's a beautiful item this is the hardback copy here um and it's just an absolute magnificent piece of work i can't you know I, I can't praise this highly enough not only is it is it a great piece of work because of the artwork that is in there but it's in the it's in the volume itself that the the paper is just a magnificent quality it's 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 gorgeous glossy paper it's a heavy publication it feels weighty it feels of quality it's got a lovely dust jacket no they haven't scrimped on this at all um uh, the, 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 you know they pushed the boat out on it it's a cracking piece of work it's got as far as i know it's got every piece of chris akileos doctor who work in here in some form or another so well, it really is the complete collection it's the definitive let's, it's the last word on chris akileos doctor who work let's have a look at the actual blurb that uh, the candy jar books released with with the title itself so it says clack the doctor who art of chris akaleos covers the official target novelizations which began in the early 70s defined a generation's image of the doctor and his adventures particularly after the show disappeared from british screens in the late 80s it's lavishly detailed with psychedelic overtones and an unapologetic pulpy sensibility these covers perfectly captured the eccentric appeal of the classic series this book collects the entirety of Achilles Doctor Who artwork in chronological order. That's crucial in chronological order, along with commentary from the artist himself, as well as some fans presenting the definitive guide to his seminal work. The, uh, the book also includes a small contribution from the 12th Doctor, Peter Capaldi, and uh, a foreword from longtime friend and collaborator, the late Terence Dix. Terence Dix, uh, we mentioned him earlier on. Yeah, I mean, it, his his con his contents more often than not were were uh, wrapped uh, were wrapped in this in this beautiful artwork. So all of these names become synonymous with our childhood with this product. But yeah, I uh, I couldn't believe it when I saw this had been announced. You know, we talked at some length with with Chris himself about his career over on the the Type Forty Doctor Who podcast here on the show, and he gave us a lot of the background to it. But until you actually see this book and hold it in your hands, you can't possibly you can't possibly review it, can you? Because you've got an idea in your head about what you would like a book like this to be like, particularly one that you've wanted for 20, 30 years, as I was saying. But when when mine was delivered, you know, I've got the I've got the softback here. When mine was was finally delivered a few weeks ago, now I, I couldn't believe it. it. First of all, I mean, it, it was uh, packaged in a bubble wrap kind of envelope. You know, there was no no danger of any any damage whatsoever. And the first thing that hits you about even the paperback edition is, as you were saying, Simon, it's, it's the weight of it and the thickness of the paper. There's no doubt in your mind that you are holding a quality item that, uh, that is going to sit with all those seminal bo uh, books, those seminal Doctor Who books that have come out over the decades that we've cherished the most. It's, it feels like okay. This is what you've been waiting for. We're not gonna. We're not gonna uh, scrimp with this. We're gonna give you your dream Doctor Who art book. And yeah, here it is. So it, it's it's come out in how many how many formats, Simon? In, in the two formats, in paperback and, and, and hardback, um, and you know it has to be said. I've got. I'm, I'm looking at both copies here. It's that good a book. 
because um, this is the paperback as, as you've got Dan um, and the, the, the truth be told that the, that the paperback is not a disappointment in compare it's half the not price of the hardback so you might be tempted to think oh really if, if I'm gonna have this book I really need it in hardback no trust me the paperback is is just it's identical to the hardback it's the same size it's identical size um, so you're not losing anything in the actual size of the reproduction of the artwork whatsoever. So you're not you're not scrimping. You're not going cheap by having the paperback. Uh, believe me, you will get just as good a publication. It's even got little. I love the fact that in the paperback you even got little fold out flaps. Uh, yeah. So it, 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 there's no danger of any damage to the corners of, of of the covers either. So the paperback itself is magnificent. Don't worry, you won't be disappointed by choosing the paperback over the hardback. Is my feeling. They're, they're both great. They're both beautiful. It's, yeah, it's just as much care has gone gone into yeah. the into the softback edition, as you say, uh, because I think you know they know Candy Jar. They are fans too. They they know the, the historical significance of a title like this. Yeah, and 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 you're right. It's not a paperback. It's a softback. You're you're correct. Uh, I'm calling it a paperback. It isn't. It is a softback. Uh, it, it's just the printing, the quality of the printing on it is phenomenal because all bar one as far as i know are the reproductions are taken from the original artwork or original transparencies of the original artwork um there's only one which we'll talk about in a little while that i understand has come from a a, a lesser source and so because of that the, the quality on the reproduction of the artwork is everything you would want it to be it's 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 better than it ever, you've ever seen this art because it's a bit like the blu-ray uh edition of the book yeah, compared yeah. with what you had with the vhs versions when you had them on target books it's that good, the quality <laughs> that good. this is a hd version so yeah who are candy jar books they've uh, they've been around for a couple of years now they're an award-winning independent book publisher and they publish a, a whole array of both fiction and non-fiction and have this line, don't they, in cult TV tie-in books, I suppose you could say. Some of them are derived, some of them are fiction that literally expand on characters from uh, shows such as Doctor Who or I ideas from those those programmes, and others are deliberately sort of nostalgic deep, li deep dives like their 100 Objects of Doctor Who book, which came out quite recently. And, uh, yeah, I think that uh, these... These publishers, these smaller press outfits, it makes you feel when, when you receive a, a title like this, the fact that it is a smaller press title, it means that they've got maybe more time to lavish care and TL, TLC on, on a book in every respect. They know who their audience is. They know... They know where each of their products sits and who will be, who will read it. They, they know the demographic absolutely perfectly and that titles like this are going to have an extended lifespan in the average Doctor Who fan's home, certainly. <laughs> yeah, we, we cherish these things for years and years and years, don't we? And uh, I think that as, t as times uh, moved on, because obviously the Target books originally under WH Allen were mass-produced and filled yeah. literally every shop in the country, whereas uh, Candy Jar... They operate mostly from from their own website, don't they? You yeah. can order all their titles direct from Candy Jar Books in in various formats. And the service—I mean, my my book came to me in this bubble wrapped envelope, as I as I said, couldn't have been more looked after. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm really OCD about my it books, even even copies of magazines. You know, I go hunting for the one that hasn't got the dink in the corner. All it, not two <laughs> fans do, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so it's if to say, when I got this envelope, I mean, I knew exactly what was in it, in the cardboard one. And when it slid out it, in that, it, it was as if the publishers were saying, it's okay, we've got you covered, we know yeah, what you're there, thinking. <laughs> there are certain larger retailers out there who will remain nameless that don't take quite as much care when they package up their items for sending out. No, you're quite right, Candy Jar, they look after, but also they look after you as a customer. It's, it's um, Candy Jar is run by a guy called Sean Russell, who is just an absolute true gent. I've spoken to him a few times. He's a lovely, lovely man. You couldn't want anybody better to be running uh, Candy Jar as a, as a niche publisher. Um, it's in good hands. The, the work 
works are in good hands. Sean cares about the product that he puts out there, content wise, quality wise, the way it's sent out, the way fans are well served. There's no cynicism here. Nobody's taking anybody for granted. Um, they're just they're just providing a, as are you know other other small publishers. They're providing a good quality production um for, for fans that are going to appreciate it and and that's all any of us can ask for you know thank you for that and so for them to team up with an artist like like chris who's been not not just a doctor who artist but a fantasy artist with all this work behind him over the years all also also vibrant it must have been reassuring for him knowing that his work was in the safest hands that they cared about they cared about reproducing it to make it look its very very best because each and every piece in this book you know i've barely even scratched the surface i think you know i've, I've dipped into it but I, every single page is just throbbing with with color every single line looks it's almost as if it could have been it's almost as if i'm staring at the originals in some cases so so going and and getting hold of original artwork and scanning it at the best possible sources, it really has paid off because there have been Doctor Who books, art books in the past, and people you know, have done their done their best. And as a way of sort of capturing, communicating the point, it, it was fine. But this is this is an art book in every sense. The paintings, that's what's going to get the majority of your attention. And, and so, quite rightly, the, no no time has been spared in getting this book out and in getting every single element and every page just as beautifully presented as it, as it possibly could be. Yeah, and what and what's interesting is that a few years back, um, the, the Target book was published um, by uh, David, the, the, the book by David Howe. Um, and I have to be honest, it's a great book. Don't get me wrong, it's a great book and I wouldn't be without it. I'm not criticising it, but Anybody that might have the Target book was a little bit disappointed by the reproduction of the artwork. Well, that was me. I just kind of thought the reproduction on the artwork is not great, in my opinion, in the Target book, although it's okay. still a cracking read. Um, it's lacking in that respect. Don't be disappointed. You know, don't worry about the reproduction in, in Clack because you won't be disappointed. It is a, it's a light years away from the reproduction of the artwork that was in, um, that was in the David Howe Target book. Uh, it really, we, we are talking, you know, HD quality here. It's it's phenomenal. And I suppose, to be fair, the Target book is the story of Target books, isn't it? Absolutely. It's, it's, you know, it's more it's, more text heavy. And, it's delivering a different, uh, doing a different job. Absolutely. And although we do get we get each each sort of uh, double page in there, it's a double page spread, isn't it? For for every single Chris Akaleos Doctor Who related piece that you can imagine whichever ones have lived in your imaginations over the last 20 30 40 years they are there with an, an entire page given over to every piece of artwork and the facing page is uh, beautifully worded well you get the the synopsis for the actual story don't you that would have been on the back of the book so you get that first and that's followed with uh, some choice words from Chris himself just talking really quite briefly. Some of them are quite, some of them are a couple of paragraphs. Some of them are four or five or six. There's only ever as much text and as many words as, as Chris needs to communicate his point about his process in reaching, in meeting the brief and to creating each individual piece of artwork. So it never feels like there's too much information, does it? It's, it's, uh, no. beautifully beautifully put together no it's, it's perfectly balanced because uh, as you say if the target book is all about the story of target books this book is all about the covers themselves it's about the artwork that's what you're buying this for is the artwork but what is nice is to get these little these little descriptions from chris himself uh, in his own words um where he talks about something to do with the mechanics covers that he likes covers that he dislikes and he's very honest um as we look through the yeah. book in a minute he's, he's honest about some of the comments that he makes in there not only about himself but other people um he he, he wears his heart on his sleeve and, and it's great to get these little these little insights into the covers that that, that you love and find yeah. a little bit find a bit more about them he's very hard on himself with some of his work very isn't hard. he and, Far too uh, hard very frank and a bit of a bit of a perfectionist i think uh, but very aware 
that it doesn't matter. At least I think he's aware. We tried to make him aware when we spoke to him, aware that, that all these things that maybe have niggled at him for a few years now have never, that's part doesn't of the matter. charm, part of the charm for us. What I like is the fact that, yeah, we've, we've got the text from Chris and, and on every page, we have a little sort of, uh, reproduction of his signature, don't we? And his emblem, which is which is on the poster prints that are behind you now, as as we're on video now. So it's it just adds that little personal touch, and and also further enhances this feel. I've got Simon say when I've sort of dipped, just dipped into the book so far, of being on a guided tour. When you go around a gallery, when you go around an art gallery or an event, so you know, the, the Target Book Covers event maybe in London, maybe that was the same. If somebody was to have guided you around that gallery, that exhibition, they'd probably say the things that Chris is saying to us on the page. And you can, and because it is, and because it is so, uh, so natural, the way that he speaks, you can actually, if you, if you, if you just sort of close your eyes, you're going to close your eyes when you look at an art book. But if you close your eyes, you can actually imagine that Chris is saying these things. You know, it's his very particular tone of voice. Yes, and and with that sense of humour, with that self-deprecation that that he's got, so it it feels like a personal experience. Yeah, it's very it's very much like you can imagine this book as yes, walking into an art gallery and looking at these pieces and having Chris standing over your shoulder saying, "I really used the wrong pen on that particular one." There's too many <laughs> dots on the doctor's face on that one, and that's great to get that degree of, of minutiae of detail because that's what Doctor Who fans love. They love those details, um, and to get those coupled with these beautiful reproductions, it's it's a cracking book. It's ten out of ten. Simple as that. Do you think that talking about looking over his shoulder, do you think that this guy felt the same way as we did? <laughs> Absolutely. You know, Peter Capaldi, we know is a Doctor Who fan. We know that he grew up with these books as well. Um, I don't doubt for, for Peter Capaldi, it was an absolute joy and a pleasure uh, to meet Chris because because he Chris is, would have been a part of Peter Capaldi's growing up just as much as, a, as you would yours and mine, Dan. Um, and what's nice, of course, is they always say, don't they? They always say, never meet your heroes uh, because you will be disappointed. Well, he, I, I've gone on record as saying Chris Achilles is absolutely one of my heroes. And it, it was not disappointing when we met him uh, virtually last year, Dan, in, in the in, in the discussion that we had with him. He is a, a true gent. Uh, it was it was a pleasure chatting to him. He's not a disappointment. You don't you don't come away thinking, oh, he's not a very nice person, is he? No, no, no. <laughs> it's 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 no disappointment. So I would say absolutely if Chris Achilles is your hero, you do need to meet him. He won't be disappointed. And it's not surprising that he has something to say about every single piece of artwork, is it? Because yeah. he seems to he seems to have an incredible recall for everything that he's ever painted. Well, and also, I, th I think the interesting thing is he clearly cares about what he did. Uh, there, uh, uh, I've said before, yeah. there's no cynicism and there isn't cynicism here. He, he's well aware of what he's doing. He's proud of what he's doing. He's he's uh, he's quite openly critical of himself when he knows he hasn't got something right or the best that it could be. So he's not taking anything for granted here. He, I think he feels very passionately about these pieces. Uh, that the, These aren't just something. Let's not forget the, the, this was a professional job for him. This is what paid his rent. Um, and so he could he could be far more detached from it and just say, well, it's just a piece of art that I knocked out. And, and but no, he's aware of the of the uh, the, the love that it is held in by Doctor Who fans and the importance it is to them. So he's, he's, he's very respectful to the fans like us who are nutters over his artwork. But he's also aware that it's a piece of artwork that he's got his name on it and he, and he wants to do the best job by it. Um, and I think he's very, pr I think he's quietly very proud of the artwork that he's done, although he'd never admit that. I don't think he's the kind of person that would say that. Um, and that's what, you know that's what makes it so endearing that, that, that he's that he's still out there in the Doctor Who world, and he's finally getting the recognition he deserves. And people are coming forward and saying, "Yes, this guy influenced me," because he he was a big influence on a lot of us. We're talking about people that are coming forward, as well as that forward, that literal forward from the late Terence Sticks, which is a, a lovely thing to have to to see Terence's yeah. words. Yeah, in a in a book that's that's covered in Chris Achilles' artwork one more time. 
So there's that. There's also, there's also a piece by Chris himself, The Doctor and Me, where he just explains briefly, I suppose, about his, his connection with, with the franchise, with this popular culture icon, I suppose, which he's never been able to to escape, which he's, he's tied to despite all that other work. And there are also items from uh, people like David Howe, who was the, the writer, she said, of the Target book, and Gary Russell, who we know is is uh, very much like us. He grew up on the Target books and you know, he's written recently written the new version of the TV movie one, for example. You know, this is a this is a writer and, and creative for, for Big Finish and BBC books and just about everything Gary Russell's done. So we know that these books were a huge influence on him. And John Colshaw also contributes and several other sort of writers, names that you recognize. Luminaries. Luminaries. Yeah. <laughs> luminaries, yeah. luminaries and good eggs, I think. Yeah. And and also people that you won't have heard of at all um, who are just fans and i don't use the word just remotely likely they're just like you and i dan they just happen to be fans yeah. and it just goes to show how many people love love the, the chris's artwork uh, and there are there, there, yeah there's about 15 20 pages at the back that are dedicated to memories uh, of people growing up with this artwork and they're lovely they're really beautifully written um there's one there's one by sean russell in there who, who is uh, as i say mr candy jar books and and it's my favorite one it's, it's cracking i'm not going to spoil it for you um but it involves an accident on a bicycle. Uh, it's ridiculous, uh, but but it's worth buying the book just purely for that one. It's a cracking, cracking little mem uh, memory from uh, from Sean. So you, so you get the feeling that this is very much a personal work on, on on all manner of levels, and and I think that speaks when you look at the contents. It speaks volumes. Look, I can't believe how how uh, meticulous it is because as you say all all this artwork has influenced all those people. And you, you think to yourself, how can they really have got together every single scrap of Chris Nicolau's Doctor Who artwork? But they genuinely they have. have. <laughs> it's yeah. not just the Target books that's in here. It's <laughs> every, every piece that he contributed towards, for example, uh, the Doctor Appreciation Society. There's a famous poster that went with one of the very early conventions. That's in there. We've got various other items such as such as this, this Tom Baker item, which I can't... That was on the front of the second Doctor Who monster book, was it? Correct, it was, yes. Um, and they've, they've even got his... Titles. Uh, which, uh, that's one of my personal favourites, actually. I can remember that yeah. so clearly on the, on the, on the shelves of WH Smith's. But they've also got his artwork from, uh, from SFX magazine. He did some modern pieces of the, of the, of the new show for, for SFX magazine. All those are reproduced in there as well. So you genuinely are getting everything to date that Chris Akelios has done. Plus, let's not forget, four brand new pieces that you won't get anywhere else. They're nowhere else apart from in this book. So... Yeah. When we spoke, when we spoke to Chris, he teased us with this, and we did. He we did. did try, didn't we? Off mic, try and get him to tell us which four stories that the man was tackling for, for this new book. Uh, he said he did tell us that he was. Uh, how can I put this? He was definite about wishing to tackle stories from the first four Doctors only, yeah. and yeah. stories that he'd never illustrated before. That yeah. was it. That was his wish list. But that still leaves quite a lot of stories for us. <laughs> <laughs> could, it, could it be this? Could it be that? Could it be the other? And all those months, Chris, and now we know. We're not going to tell you. You're going to have to get hold of the book and find out for yourselves because you know everything comes to those who wait. And it is worth the wait when you turn the page and see this artwork. It, the new stuff sits seamlessly, doesn't it, with, with the old stuff. It represents an evolution. And Chris has reconnected with some of those techniques from his earliest covers and kind of refine those too because he knows what his punters want he knows what we like because let's face it we haven't left the guy alone for the last 30 40 years <laughs> telling him at various conventions or wherever we wherever you may bump into chris uh yes it's it's all there but um the thing that really impressed me as well is the amount of private commissions that are also in the book side. Yeah. Yeah, you all the think... private commissions. Well, I don't know whether all the private commissions in there. I honestly couldn't tell you that. Or maybe there are private commissions that people requested not to have reproduced. I don't know. But certainly there are private commissions in there. And, you know, we'll have as we go through the book, we'll we'll show you a couple of those as well. And we'll have a look at some of those, too. That's so, so generous that I don't think any anybody could have really expected because a private commission is a private commission. But, yeah, there, there are some beautiful images in there that certainly I've never seen before. Mm -hmm. And and you do get a feeling of of an entire career and a well of affection for for the subject matter, for the original books, for the subject matter itself, 
and dare I say, for us readers too, it does feel like it's a sort of kiss blown back. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's, yeah it's, it, it is a great it's piece a of work. Lovely, and... a lovely title. So I understand you're going to take us into the pages. I am. Oh, yeah, crap. we'll have a look through it. If you're oh, ready, we'll have a look through it. We'll have a look yes, through it. some of it, at least. Let's go, let's go for that. Here we are. Let's get extra dimensional. <laughs> Yeah, let's, let's get into that dust jacket and have a closer look at uh, Clack, the Doctor Who art of Chris Akello, who's up close here with Simon Horton. Go yeah, this, let's this, get stuck in. I mean, it really is, it's a coffee, it's, it's the coffee table book that every Doctor Who fan should have, let's be honest, because this really is, this is a coffee table kind of, but it's the best coffee table book we've ever had from Doctor Who. I love the fact that they've reproduced all of the, um, all of Chris's target books in, in, in covers in, in, in the, in the end papers. Um, so as I say, this, it's like you were saying earlier, Dan, they've, it reeks quality. They've just, they've spent a long time over putting this together. Um, there's lots of photos in here with his family, even with Chris's family in there some cracking photos a lovely one here of liz sladen and tom yeah. baker um so there's some really good good quality stuff in here it isn't just about the covers um but then we get to what we're all here for which are the covers and this obviously it goes in chronological order so we start with the daleks which is still one of my favorites i love, love this it. cover and it's amazing because it wasn't until we spoke to chris last year that I realised stupidly that the TARDIS is the wrong colour, it's pink. And I'd never noticed that. And Chris is very honest in his little description here. He's very honest. He says, I didn't know what colour the TARDIS was, so I did it pink. Um, he hadn't got reference photos, so it ends up pink. But I love that because it gives this real comic book graphic sensibility yeah. to, 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 to the artwork. Well, he talked a lot to us, didn't he, about his love of Jack Kirby and a lot of those yeah. Marvel comics artists from that would have been the yeah. mid to late sixties around that time. He, you know, he's, yeah. he was very much fanboying over that when we spoke to him. Absolutely. And the, the Daleks are very uh, on this, are very much TV 21 um, comic book <laughs> Daleks. And, and I think what's interesting about this is it shows how unhands on the BBC were with branding back in the day. Cause they, can you imagine them allowing a pink TARDIS now? No, it's just on the cover of the hat. It wouldn't fit in with the branding. You can't do it. And these are the wrong Daleks. You can't have these Daleks. So it, actually they, it, they'd be fine with it. If it was pride month, that would be okay. They, they would, they would. Yes, you're quite right actually. But and, and the, on this piece, one of the things I love about this is the early signature is immediately there from Chris, which is these fantastic little planets and fireballs burning on, on, on William Hartnell's jacket. So already he's bringing that sensibility that runs through all of his covers. Um, it's there literally from day one. And that remains one of my favorites. The Zabi, which is the second of the three that of these first releases. Now this one I think is interesting because this to me, I don't know what you think, Dan, yeah. The William Hartnell on that is the best artistic depiction of William Hartnell I have ever seen anybody do. It is utterly, utterly magnificent. The expression on Hartnell's face that he captures there is second to none. I've never seen yeah. a better visual in, uh, artistic interpretation of Hartnell. I love this cover, which is why it's I've got because, it up on my wall. It's because it captures the twinkle. It's, it, it, even though he's frowning for all, for all intents, at first glance, he's frowning. He doesn't look happy. He looks very, very serious about the task at hand. He's going to sort these giant ants and yes. wasp and various other things out. But there yes. is something of the heart not twinkle there, which is very difficult to capture. It's just it's just beautiful. And again, you've got all the all the planets and you've got this fizzing, which which again, as, as fans, we love this sort of the early yeah. signs of this fizzing energy that's going on. That again, he's well, sort you, of you know what that brings to mind to me, the early days of TV. And when, when a TV would either get switched on or switched off, yes. and, and you used to get that sort of burning thing where the picture that you just watched would gradually disappear. Yes. And that's what it reminds me. It would, it would almost fizz and melt. And I think you're right. And I think what where that, that helps Chris's artwork is it literally does bring it out of the page. It, <laughs> I'm probably you know, being really pretentious there. Sorry, Chris. But, uh, <laughs> but that's honestly what it brings to mind. But it's true. It, 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 you're right. And as I say, that to me is, is part of the, the, the fascination with Chris's yeah. artwork. Is it is it these aren't just well, there are some other target artists out there that I love as well, but they bring a far more photorealistic approach to it, such as uh, Jeff Cummins, for example, which I love that stuff. But this, to me, because it, it brings such an unusual oh, artistic yeah. graphic style, that's one of the things I, I just love about this. Um, the, the, the Crusaders, 
this is the one that um, Chris himself is very critical of. Well, not critical of, of the cover, but critical of himself because he reckons he chose too fine a pen to do the dots on uh, on, on Hartnell. And so it took him far too long <laughs> to do. There were too many dots on Hartnell. Yes. Painted but in it, 1974 I mean, and the guy was still moaning about it last year to us. <laughs> <laughs> And yet you look at the lighting that he's captured on this Hartnell, the, 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 you know, the, the yeah. way the light is... I think it's beautiful. Oh, I've always loved that cover. Beautiful. It's magnificent. And what's remarkable in part of the commentary here from, from Chris is that he says he didn't have any reference material for any of the rest of it. So these are all just done, done from his imagination. And what amazes me is how much like Julian Glover, his interpretation of Richard yeah, actually perfect. ends up. And he had no reference material. He didn't know. He didn't know what he was doing. It was all from his own mind. <laughs> and I, I do. I do love that about because there are numerous pieces throughout throughout his time on Target, and I would imagine throughout his career where he's he says, "Oh, you know, for for that particular piece, I had a a book on uh, famous seafaring vessels or yeah. or various various aeroplanes or certain types of a tunic that people, you know, this man he either really really researched his subject." Or was just really, really well read and took in graphic information from childhood to adulthood, and, and it all just poured out into this artwork. That's right. That's right. Um, we all do that. But... This this is one remains one of my favourite. Look, the, the, the cave monsters is fantastic, yeah. and again, he he added the T Rex in um, from from, uh, from he drew that w without any use of reference photos, and this is where, of course, with all this fizzy energy down the side, this is where we really now start to get a feel for that signature Chris Achilleos style um, uh, with with the, with that yeah, graphic it's style. To establish starting, itself now yeah start, that's right it's starting to come together and it kind of goes into over overload here with with the day of the daleks where he really is i think you, you get the feel that he's really beginning to get his confidence yeah. now for what he's doing um I, I i love the color palettes that he uses on this because it's again it's so unusual what a strange decision to just use earth colors uh, oranges and browns and golds it's an odd choice, but this is again one of the things I love about his work. They, they're often odd choices that you or I wouldn't think to do. Yeah, it's like the inside of a lava lamp. Yeah, it is, and and he he's very honest in his commentary on this one. Again, I've never noticed this before. The the stalks are the wrong way round on the Daleks on this. The gun stick and the and the and the plunger are, are, the, are the wrong way round. Never noticed it before, but he's but he's that honest about his stuff. That, um, that he brings it out. He's very honest about this one as well. He hates, uh, this is one of his least favourite is the Doomsday Weapon, which is odd because it's one of my favourites. I love the Doomsday Weapon. I love these claws. See, the now, now he said that I can see that I can see the comic book influence yeah. in it again with, with yeah. the claws. Yeah. But, it, but he's he's critical of his of his color choices in this one and I, you know as I say I don't understand because I love the color choices in this I've always loved this particular piece of uh, piece of artwork yeah, so. um, uh, 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 and and, it, and it's interesting because I, I know that um, John Pertwee was quite critical uh, quite openly critical I think to Chris about uh, how how he felt that Chris often got the size of his nose wrong. Well, we know that Pertwee was very, very touchy about the size of his nose. And so apparently Chris says in, in the blurb for this one that, that, that Pertwee was, was not happy about the size of his nose on, on, on a couple of these pieces. And isn't and it the truth as well, Simon, that they gave him very few, if the, the uh, photographs that he had got, there were yeah. very, very few of them, often only a handful at most. Very, very few in Valvetry, and and Chris himself had to go and dig these out of of an archive. I think I think he was he was you know given a couple of quid to go to the BBC archive and, <laughs> and pull out a couple. And, you know, yeah. I, again, this would not happen today. He was working with next to nothing. Um, but what I think is quite sad with all this is Chris again says in his blurb for this one that Pert, we literally to use um, to use Chris's words never gave him the time of day, which I think is. Really really sad i i can only assume that Pert, we were yeah. so miffed about about how chris depicted the size of his nose and yet the depictions of, of pert we are, are magnificent again they're spot on yeah there's nothing wrong with them maybe that um, was the problem the, <laughs> yeah well pert we was sure yeah yeah maybe that is the problem um whereas tom baker apparently chris says was an absolute gentleman um interesting this is one of my least favorite chris achilleos pieces I, it, it, it's it's if I'm going to be really really picky and I'm being really picky now, um, this is one of my least favourites. And, and Chris himself is is not uh, not entirely. Since he was running out of ideas for the square so this format, is, this is for the 
this is for the demon. So yeah, we can see him trying new new things already, yeah. trying new ways to add dimensions to move things back uh, to the to the background, the foreground, just mixing the elements up of what could be done within that really Absolutely. quite confined space. And this is also where I think, without me checking up, I think this is the first time. Oh no, no, Achilleos has appeared uh, on a couple of them uh, already, because uh, you can very clearly see the name Achilleos down at the bottom of this one, which has say, oh, she's to intrigue me as a kid. Um, uh, but then once we get into the Sea Devils, now again, I think he's, he's he's becoming more confident. The style is becoming established by now, because um, that to me is a world away from from that one for example um he, he's confident at this point this i feel like he's, yeah, yeah he's, he's 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 motoring now i feel um uh, and, th and this is this is one of chris's own personal favorites for the abominable yeah, snowman and again i mean i think this is probably one of the best if not the best depiction i was artist just thinking the same Trouton. thing yeah. yeah, it's knockout. Again, the lighting is beautiful. The hair is beautiful. The detail. He's captured the likeness 100%. Um, and so I think, arguably, this is possibly the best artistic depiction I, I can this one, of this one has been reproduced a lot of times, isn't it? I mean, on the left-hand side, you can also see that this is something that also runs through the book. We get examples of the artwork when it's been used in other media. So on audio CDs for the, the audio book readings, for example, or uh, the later reprints. There are a few reprints a few years ago, weren't there, for, I think it was on the yeah. BBC books when, when they yeah. put them out with gold and logos. So you get all, all right. of those throughout the book too. It's, it's exhausting, right. the detail. And, and you even get, you know, this is the Turkish edition here. We've got Dr. Kim, <laughs> the Turkish edition. So so the, the attention to detail in this that you get is, is fantastic. And obviously you get a, a lovely reproduction of it, how it appears on the original print of the target uh, target edition uh, uh, as well um curse of peladon great uh, another another fantastic classic that is a classic of the of the, that, that kind of early style um same yeah. again with with the, with the, the yeah. cybermen and again this is interesting because he's honest in his blurb that he got the wrong cyberman and again call me stupid i would never noticed that this was the wrong cyberman <laughs> because i think we've got I would have read this long, long before, long I, before. Uh, yeah, before same I saw me. the moon base. So I didn't know they were the wrong Cybermen. So I've grown up thinking of these as the right Cybermen for the moon base, even though I know obviously they're not. It's right with what you're saying, Dan. Chris's it's work exists in its own right as well. I think so. Representative of those stories. And in the choices of colour as well. I mean, the, the flashes of orange on the Cyberman's chest unit uh, they correspond with the fizzing energy absolutely reaching reaching its way up the guy knew what he was doing didn't he he really didn't just <laughs> throw, the, throw these things together and this to me is where it suddenly literally launches into the stratosphere um this is the first cover that is is a full piece of artwork um with the with the deliberate intention of the artwork to run behind the logo, behind the logo. Um, yeah. and so this to me is when it moves into an it literally comes off the page at this point i think we're into an entirely new level he's got all um, that extra room all that extra canvas to yeah. play with bring that yeah and and the bombast and the confidence at this point i think again is off the scale to, to because suddenly we've got these hands which we know famously and he's honest about it that he borrowed them from jack kirby's cover for the fantastic four comic doesn't matter a job because this cover is stunning and it's the don't confidence you think that the, the fire behind omega as well reminds me of a visual effect from a 1970s bbc tv show it looks Absolutely. like it could be chroma key or <laughs> yeah yeah it, it absolutely could be and the fact that you've got these again you 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 he's mirrored the orange of uh, the background into the orange of these of these bolts coming down to the doctor's heads and as i say to me that shows confidence to to it would have been far simpler just to do the hands over the doctors and be done to put these energy bolts going into the doctor it's a it's a slightly risky thing to do and it shows the fact that he's prepared yeah. to take chances yeah, to be that little bit daring to 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 not not conform um to what you you might expect it daring to do. is the right word yeah yeah and again this one again it just pops off the page this i remember being obsessed by this one as a child yeah i um, found that's the book that's the book i found in my school library 
that that one and the giant robot they were both there that that one in particular i i just had to know I and, and interestingly with me it was this one and the 10th planet these were the two that i found in my library was the 10th planet and this one um and this was the one i wanted to read because i could remember this one being on television so to find a book for this and and again this bold use of of, of these this color background it's just so odd people wouldn't think to necessarily do it I, i'm fascinated to get inside his head and work out what made you think of doing such an odd thing behind the doctor but it works so so brilliantly it always reminds me of, of the uh, the looney tunes that's all folks yeah, yeah. Um, and he mentions this in his blurb he says that that, that, that it's got that kind of vibe to it um, and I, what i also like as well is how the scarasan is is right on the bottom line of the artwork goes off that that would bleed out whereas the the zygon is inside the frame yeah so so you've got that extra extra three-dimensional look to it I, I love how it plays with those Correct. things that's that's something that i've done i, I don't know if i think i probably did pick it up from this piece come to think of it and and uh, the things that i've illustrated i've done a lot of work with borders particularly when i was working on children's books and so to see that and, and the depth of field there and the way that his scarf the, the zygon's hand is just coming across the scarf but the scarf also trails trousers for the bleed area little touches like that little decisions that would have been made very you know just with with confidence yes it's 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 all about composition it isn't just the skill with which he reproduces this stuff it is the skill of the composition he's got the photographer's eye to compose these things to put them together he he talks a lot in the book about triangles and here here is a classic example of where you've got this triangle shape um so he's thought about this stuff it isn't it isn't um it isn't just in the reproduction. By the way, sorry about the slight glare on this, uh, and, and the, the reproduction isn't brilliant here simply because we're on a we're on a webcam. Trust me, they look a million times better than they than they look at the I'm, moment on this. I was webcam just thinking, I was just thinking how off. good it looked, but obviously, yeah, it does look it does look incredible in it, real life. Yeah, it, it looks even better. And then, of course, this is the probably his most famous piece of all of them because of that clack. Because and, and, and he talks in, in the blurb about the fight that he had getting the clack on the cover that the publishers didn't want. And this was the proof, if any, be needed that, it, that, that Chris understood more than the publishers did about what the, what the kids wanted. Because he knew the kids would love seeing this clack there. And of course, he was right. And the re this is the, one of the things that still stuns me to this day is that is the detail, the reproduction on the T-Rex, on those slavering jaws. Um, with the saliva all running down and, and the glistening teeth, you know the detail on that. It's incredible, and the reproduction <laughs> in the book is just beautiful. You, and you just know to... he was having the time. Of, you just know he was having the time of his life on that kind of monster. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I think I think we can say he was enjoying himself with this yeah. one. I think this is probably yeah. the. the he kind of probably the peak of his enjoyment of actually doing them um he's critical of this one um which which as i say i don't i don't subscribe to because this is one of my favorites i i adore this cover um and this i think unless i'm mistaken this is one of the ones that is not taken from either an original piece or from a transparency this has not been scanned from original okay. as i understand I and you can guess. see in the reproduction the reproduction isn't as good on this one um it's not bad don't get me wrong you needn't worry it's not disappointing um but i think the piece for this has gone missing i think he's obviously to to, to make it clear i don't think chris owns any of these pieces at all they've all gone out to private uh, to private collectors and so i'm assuming that chris must have borrowed these back or candy jar rather would have borrowed these pieces back to get hd scans off them and as i say from what i understand the tenth planet is sadly one of those pieces that is lost out in the ether i don't think anybody knows where the tenth planet original has gone um but the reproduction say is still great in here and then you know we're getting to the ice warriors where we're really cooking with gas now uh again pro probably he's amongst his most famous pieces um and of course Definitely. doesn't even feature the doctor on it like, which is interesting and again victoria is totally out of the frame yeah the ice warrior behind her but the energy yeah. is also breaking breaking out of the frame too beautifully yeah and again he's he's matched the the, the yellow 
and, and the gold on the fizzing energy with the yellow and the gold highlights yeah. on it. Um, and I remember seeing this particular cover as a kid. And again, I didn't know it was a second Doctor story. There's no Doctor on there, so you've got nothing to That's work on. Part of I haven't got a clue. Didn't the, the, amount of books, the amount of books that I bought not knowing which the Doctor was. And it just didn't matter because, boy, you know, come on, does that cover leap out at you or what? Yeah, it's, um, it's and the reproduction one. again on, on this one in the book is, is just magnificent. Um, Chris sort of says that this is a bit of a throwback to his early style, which it is. This is a throwback to the to those early John Pertwee's with, with, with no colour background. And he criticises himself and says he should have done a colour color background on that. Um, but 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 one of the one of the little details on this that really jumps out at you on this reproduction now on these high quality reproductions that isn't evident on the on the target book at all is that when you look really really closely in the Cyberman's eyes there's red just on the inside edge of the Cyberman's eyes it looks like blood it almost looks like little drops of blood collecting in the tear ducts of, of the eyes on the Cyberman yeah, yeah. he's again he's thought about this there's no need for that to be Most there I'm tough. sure that. Yeah, I'm sure that's a deliberate, um, deliberate decision. One of his favourites is Genesis of the Daleks because of the because of the, um, the Davros, and it is again one of the best reproductive yeah, it's, artistic. It's an amazing piece of Dav Davros art. Beautiful, and again a bold choice of colours. These earth tones. Then these, it's an odd choice of colours. Looks, it looks like a, a scroll, doesn't it? That's been sort of unravelled. Yeah. I think the talk of Genesis. I mean, whether he did it del deliberately to look a little bit biblical, I don't know. It's don't know, but, me, it, but again, it works. It, uh, and the, and this where we've got the reproduction of the original cover the, 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 with the, the red, with the red, the logo. red just then pops out and works beautifully with the. the so again, Target knew what they were doing with these uh, with these covers by now. They 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 got it licked as well. Same with the web of fear, the purple from the logo just works beautifully. That, with that the, ring around the unit soldier as well. Yeah. I've always loved yeah. that. Again, as a kid, you were just so excited by this work. You, it, it, again, yeah. again it's, just, it's just asking to be um, to be read. Same with the space war. Well, I was watching Doctor Who in the 80s when I was picking up these books. And I thought, wow, was that really the, the special effects coming off the Yeti? Because Doctor Who now hasn't got special effects as good as it did in the 60s by the look of this. <laughs> and, of course, a lot of this stuff, it's not in the books. Chris is coming yeah. up with stuff that he's... It, sorry, it's not in the television yeah. programme or in the book. Um, he's coming up with his own stuff here. He's, he's putting his own interpretation onto it. Um, oh. Space War has to be... It, it's a beautiful piece of artwork, and I think this of all of them, this is the one where the, the artwork way, way, way outstrips the, the, the television series, which to screams, me... Screams, screams epic to me yeah, that does it does it's it's Star Wars Wars of a lot of chris's other signature ideas you know the submarine from the sea devils he, he does the, a similar thing with the spacecraft there but it's much more effective i think here break, bringing the white across the artwork like that i i yes. love that one and what i think is interesting this was published in 1976 for the completest here all of the original release dates are in the book um and even the order in which they were released um and so this was released the year before Star Wars, but that that's pretty Star Wars. -esque. It's a very Star Warsy piece of artwork, yeah. I mean, it's, then again, I always say that Star Wars didn't really happen in in a bubble; that there were things that were influencing that too. So yeah, yeah, and and that and that to me, it's ahead of its time, and it's the sort of depiction of, of it's before Battlestar Galactica, uh, before before Star Trek movies. Um, so that to me is kind of ahead of its time. And this, to me, is is yeah. probably about as good as Chris Achilles' artwork gets, um, which, again, is the reason why I've got it up on my wall. Uh, I mean, look at gosh. the layers that that's working on there. I know. You, you, you can't help but admire this piece. And, again, as a child, I obsessed over this piece of artwork. I, I, I lost hours just staring at this piece of artwork <laughs> on, on the target cover. My favourite bit is the, are the little tiny spits of fire that are just falling out of the of the gun stick what made him think of doing that of just getting those little those little sparks of 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 liquid fire falling out of the gun stick um, that, that really just bring it to life the well, it, brings home, it brings home as well the jeopardy that the the doctor and the thaw yes I remember that character's name tussling with that dalek you know the daleks yeah. are fearsome they are they are warriors. They are small tanks. They are weapons of war. Yes. 
and 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 the and the, you know, the gun metal reproduction that that he brings to the to the Dalek, and as you say, the way the layers that you've got with it, um, there is no more confident cover, I don't think, no, than, no, than, than Planet of the Daleks. Um, and again, it, it, the truth be told, it is better than the TV story. Um, yeah, I can't stand that story. <laughs> Chris is don't get me wrong. I love Planet of the Daleks, but but. The, the, I, I want to see that version of Planet yeah. of the Daleks. Not, I've, not never, the I've never did. warmed to the story, but I do love that piece of artwork. And, oh, this is a story that I do adore, though. Yeah, and Chris is, again, he's, he's very self-deprecating on this one. He's critical of this one. It's one of my absolute favourites, uh, Pyramids of Mars. Yeah. Um, I, I, I love the, the choice of colour. Uh, he's even critical of his... his um, of his rendering of of Elizabeth Sladen on this one, and I, 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 sorry Chris, but I don't know where you're coming from. That 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 rendering of of, of Elizabeth Sladen is magnificent. It's beautiful. It captures her likeness perfectly. Her steely steadfastness, her, her gravitas. It's gorgeous. I love Tom Baker in in that he's he's so grave. As, as Tom Baker yeah. often was in Doctor Who. He, he, so Chris really recreates that that grave gravitas that Tom brings to the role and the colours are just so warm. So, uh, sorry, Chris, this is this is one of my favourites. Uh, 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 you, there's no need to be critical of this one at all. He literally says himself at the bottom, could do better. No, Chris, you couldn't. This is perfect. <laughs> this is perfect artwork, trust me. Um, and then this is your favourite, isn't it? Oh, I know it's your favourite, Dan. Every time I see, I mean, you talk about you're talking about the uh, the the dinosaur in the earlier piece uh, with the sea monster here on on uh, Carnival of Monsters. We get this. I mean, the way that the sea water is dripping out of its mouth like that, I, it's just incredible. It's and a the, superb piece of work. The look on Pertwee's face, as if to yeah. say. I'll make short work of you. I'm, not, I'm going to have none of your nonsense. I'm taking control. I'm always in control. You can come with me. Yeah, quite all right. Absolutely. As as Chris says in his commentary down here, Pertwee looks very imposing. Yeah, he yeah. does. Uh, it, it captures that sort of pomposity um, that is so adorable about Pertwee's performance. <laughs> yeah. uh, he, he gets it absolutely. He's got that sparkle in the eye. It's, it's a, a phenomenal piece of work, and and, and um, you know it's one of Chris's favourites. Unlike this one, which is one of Chris's least favorite. Oh, he's really down again. on this, isn't he? Yeah. He's really down on this. Down on the sorry, Chris. Chris. Again, you're on your own. This is one of my <laughs> favorites. You've been told. <laughs> You've been uh, told, mate. I mean, look at it. It's a magnificent <laughs> piece of work. This is to me. Um, I know that Chris. I've always loved it, too. Yeah, Chris is critical about the, 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 the Doctor and Sarah down the bottom here. He doesn't think he captured those desperately well. Um, Again, this is very comic booky, isn't it, Simon, this one? Yeah, yeah, it's very graphic. It needs, it need, like, like the Dinosaur Invasion has clack, this needs boom or something like that over yeah. the top of this, really, to bring it home. Yeah. Um, yeah. Because Chris quite rightly points out in his commentary that he, he's pleased with the explosion. Too right, you are, you should be pleased. The explosion is is incredible. But all of this in the background, the crinoid has, again, I want to see this version of the Seeds of Doom because it outstrips the model work and the model work in Seeds of Doom is good. But this is better. Um, the fire coming out of uh, of the mansion, the, 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 the spitfire or whatever it is going over. <sighs> That's a cracking piece of art, isn't it? You want to read that book, don't you? Ridiculously excited. And I, and so sorry, I, I can't understand why uh, he's down on this one. Oh, Dark that's... Invasion of Earth is an interesting one. This is the very first Target paperback that I bought. This is the first one I owned. So this has a very, very uh, uh, special place in my heart, this particular piece of artwork. Um, because because it was the first target book i owned and again what's interesting with this is he uses all the lot he, he honestly says that he uses everything in it is wrong the roboman's wrong <laughs> the spaceship is wrong the daleks right apart from the color we've got a pink dalek it, it, that's what it makes just, it again. it just works it... don't tell me about it boy does that work i mean it's it, it's kind of it's I kind really of the love... that the movie should have had yeah, I really love how it sort of um, harkens back to uh, wartime and propaganda yes. posters for the for the Nazis. Yeah, and yeah. particularly because it makes the the spacecraft look a, a little like a zeppelin, 
And yeah. I love how the underside of it is lit and the top yeah. is darker like that. And I and I love the fact that you've got another three little uh, spaceships there disappearing into the distance. It's an unusual choice, again, to put the Roboman front and centre. You would put the Dalek front and centre. You should do. So why didn't you? I don't know. But it works because the Dalek isn't front and centre. Chris just knows what he's doing. And again, as a child, I obsessed over that Robo Man because, again, boy, if you've seen the TV serial, they are a disappointment when you see <laughs> the book cover. Yes, uh, yes. Because, again, these are the Robo Men you want to see. Um, that's just, it, that's got to be one of the best ever, hasn't it? Surely that's 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 up there. I think it's certainly one of the most, one of the most realistic, one of the most seductive of the, yeah, of the you can almost step inside the thing seductive is the perfect word this is one of chris's favorites claws of axos which is also on yeah, the coffee mug of today i know you love this one don't you Chris? Yeah. No, dan yeah i i i don't know what it is i think it's the comic book feel to it again i yeah. i love the fact that the uh the axon's eyes are yeah. blaring out like that and again where, where he has the the doctor it's well, it's all perfectly balanced again Yes, uh, and the, the the golden hues. Yeah, I, I, I've always loved that. It's partly because I love the book so much. That's probably the Doctor Who book that I've read the most. I, I've got to have read it 12, 15 times. It's quite a lot for me because I'm not a massive reader, but I do tend to go back to that one. <laughs> and it's interesting because because Chris says in the commentary about those rays that you just talked about, Dan, that, that again, it was a brave decision to put those rays in because once those rays were in, and in the reproduction in this book, you can literally see, you can literally see uh, the, 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 the airbrush that the, the, the oh, splatters from, from the reproduction is incredible. But it was, but again, it was a brave thing to do because as he says in his commentary, once they were on, they were on. He couldn't take them off. You didn't have an undo <laughs> button in those days. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, if it, so if they didn't work, he was stuck with them so again he's, he's making brave brave decisions um spectacular absolutely spectacular and this of course is, is the very last cover that he did for the for the full target range um so this is a bittersweet cover really um he he was he was dragged back onto this one uh, well onto the onto the, the, the dark invasion of earth and the seeds of doom and the ark in space were the last three that he did for the for the full range um that he was persuaded back to do after in effect um walking off the range he was persuaded back and so this is his last one and tom in in typically somber tom form again it's a bold decision tom isn't even looking at us he's looking down on this one it's a very somber the, dark of the world tom. of the universe on his shoulders there very much so that the, the scarf is not the the proper colors that you would expect it's a very dark scarf this is a dark cover in every sense of the word um but as a child again it just electrified me it's the fact that the wirren's tentacles yeah. are just looping just round tom's chin drawing him in um, again it just it, 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 it sets you it sets your imagination yeah. on fire um a delightful piece. this is again is yeah it's just beautiful composition so Remind us that that's from the first monster book, isn't it? This Correct. Book. And and it, 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 for the completest out there, the book reproduces the original cover and the and the nineteen eighty six uh, reprint. Um, so so you've, you you you've got a full the, the full collection of how these appeared on the book covers. And these were great. I mean, again, so exciting for a child. Same with the Amazing wow. World book, um, which. Again, he's one of the pieces that he is not taken from the original artwork, um, which Chris tells us in the in the commentary has, has gone missing because when he asked for it back from the publisher, which was not W. H. Allen, the art director had apparently given it away. He'd given the original piece of art away. Just gave it away. So we still don't know where the original for this piece of artwork is. Um, fortunately, Chris has got a transparency. So the reproduction in this book is second to none. You wouldn't know that this is not taken from the um, from the original artwork. It's it's magnificent. But I guess the difference is a hell of a lot of work in that. Oh, incredible amount of work, possibly, arguably, maybe his most detailed piece of, of Doctor yeah. Who art ever. Now you've pointed it out, Dan. Um, incredible amount of detail in it. And again, just so exciting for, for, for a child. I remember this coming out on, on the 
book cover um, that it accompanied, which was The Amazing World of Doctor Who. Um, and again, for the completest, you get all the reproductions here, even the even the piece that's on the back cover uh, yeah. that Chris did. Um, a magnificent piece of work. The making of Doctor Who, uh, a, a, again, a, a very iconic piece, an iconic reproduction mm -hmm. of... of, of um, of Tom, um, the second Dalek, uh, second monster book, sh sh which you showed earlier on, Dan, which is again is one of my favourites. I mean, beautiful detail, beautiful it's renditions. Slightly of every... more sinister as well, with the Doctor with his head turning to the side like that. Yeah, and again, an unusual choice. Why would you turn the Doctor to the side? You wouldn't. So it's all wrong. But that's what it makes works it so, so well. Yeah. <laughs> that's what that's why chris stands out because he makes these really unusual choices um and this one that you that you mentioned earlier which, which is yeah this is a magnificent piece of artwork that he did for the appreciation society in the anniversary year um and it graced the the cover of their of their making of the five doctors um book and again an incredible piece of detail in this uh, in fact, probably this takes the, the record of the most detailed piece of uh, Chris's work and the rendition of, of Peter Davison, which is one of the only two, yes. two occasions that he does Peter Davison. It's, it's magnificent. He captures the likeness perfectly, the same as he does with all of the Doctors on this. It truly is a stupendous That, that one has always felt to me celebratory. Yeah, absolutely. This, this to me says the anniversary year uh, better than anything. Uh, it, it's just a knockout and piece the of The Daleks art. are giving a sort of 21 gun salute there. They're not, <laughs> that's the impression I get. They're sort of firing in, the, yeah. in celebration of Doctor Who rather than yes. attacking it. You know, it, that's how it feels to me. Yes, you're right there, Dan. And again, the reproduction on this is just phenomenal. Uh, you, you've, you Trust me, you've got to buy the book just purely for these reproductions. They are, <laughs> they are stunning. Um, and that really was his last piece of artwork for, for, you know, for a long time. But we get into lots of, this is some, some unusual stuff about sketch cards from 2006. And then we then into, into the new artwork. Into these reprints. The, the, the reprints, yeah. which is only the second time he's done Davison. And he's, again, he's very critical of his rendition of Davison. No need to be. It's a, it's a, it's a good, uh, it's a good rendition and a beautiful Terraleptal. You know, th th yeah. this is as good as anything. Um, Vengeance and Barris, interestingly, on the book cover, which is reproduced down here, they made that they, they insisted on removing the noose from around uh, Colin yeah. Baker's neck, which I'd never noticed. I've only, I, no, I've only just noticed that. Yeah, but so so you get the original piece of artwork here, as you should do, with the noose around the neck, um, which was digitally removed because Chris refused to take it off. He said, no, you remove it digitally. I'm not doing it. <laughs> so they do for the book cover. But in the book, you get the proper the proper Ever version. The Chris wanted you to see it. Together with, beautifully, you get some of these little sketches um, down down here in the bottom. His his original his original sketches um, that give you an idea of the of the sort of progression. Um, yeah. Again, don't worry about how it looks on the webcam. It it looks fantastic in the book. Um, and I love this one of Sylvester McCoy as well. Battlefield is great. Um, but Chris conjures up that dreamlike atmosphere that, yeah. that the best the best moments of Battlefield have got. Yes, but Chris is honest about all three of these pieces. He says quite honestly, his heart wasn't in it. He doesn't like this era of Doctor Who. He struggled to quite get into the. Into, yeah, absolutely. He was feeling it with 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 all of the first four Doctors and never felt it. He honestly says he never felt it from Davison onwards. Um, but there's nothing to be ashamed of. They're cracking pieces. Um, this was a private commission for Keys and Mariners. So this is where you really start to get into these beautiful private commissions that I've never, ever seen this before in my no, life. This, and it's this is what struck me. I'd never seen this before either. And that uh, the incorporation of the title sequence there into the, into yeah. the artwork. Uh, and what's beautiful, once you get into this particular section of the book, is you still get the reproduction, the, the mock-ups, as they would as have appeared, were books. Yeah. had they been done as target books, which is for a fan. Nice touch. A beautiful, beautiful touch. And so we arrive at one of his first of four new pieces for the book, The Aztecs, which is, I know you love this one, don't you, Dan? This is probably my favourite of the of the new ones, yeah. 
it's I just uh, the, it's the graphical elements. I think yeah. that again we've got some things in the foreground, some things in, in the background. I think it's I think it's very bold. I think it's animated as well in the same way that the uh, the claws of access, the eyes that you were talking about. We've got uh, to Toxel there with the the rays sort of coming behind him, and yeah. as he's about to make that sacrifice, I just think it's really evocative and, uh, and again quite daring. And again, it's absolutely what the cover would have been had he done the Aztecs back in 19. Yeah, I think it probably it would have been. That's yeah, what he would have ended up with. And you get the again the lovely reproduction with the proper block logo. They put the correct logo on there that you would have had. Um, wow. Dark Invasion. Of Earth, it's another. It's another private commission. It, it isn't my favourite. I, I prefer the original. I still, even though this is all now correct. Uh, <laughs> the invasion of Earth can't be better for me, but the the reproduction of the Daleks here, the rendering of the Daleks is magnificent in their own right. The it's Daleks. the saucers, it's the flying saucers. I just I love the way that they're sort of they're coming in in this sort of loose formation, yeah, because the 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 most of the Earth has been laid waste to, and yes. they're just sort of keeping an eye, keeping us under their boot. Yeah, I think that co that conjures up the TV story just beautifully you're right it's a much much better reproduction uh, representation rather of the television the story television. and what i love about this is is and in a few of these pieces now chris starts to move into doing the doctor in pencil um which i really it's a really unusual approach that he's never done before that i i really like the way we've got the doctor in pencil that it Hartman works is, isn't it yeah, it absolutely works because Hartley's is this kind of slightly ethereal shadow resting behind the, the, what is the meat of the story, which are the Daleks. Um, it, again, the composition, the balance just feels spot on. Um, same with the, the evil of the Daleks, uh, which again, I think is a private commission um, from 1985. Again, just a magnificent, uh, magnificent piece of uh, work. Um, and again, the a different version of the Tomb of the Cyberman from the Jeff, Jeff Cummings original um, with the correct Cybermen. I love the rendition on the Cybermen here. And, and this, of all of them, this is my favourite mock-up of a Target cover in the book. You can't make it out in this on the webcam, but this is magnificent because what they've actually done is they've taken Chris's original piece of artwork on the right uh, and, and they filled in the background with black. So there's so much black because the logo is in black as well on this cover. As but if it's it a tomb, yeah. Correct. It works like a dream on, on this mock-up. I love all the black. I um, love how the energy looks like a claw. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. So the original piece of artwork is magnificent in its own right. And then the rendition that they've done on the target uh, mock-up is beautiful as well. Cool, um, did. And this is my this is another brand new one, the second brand new one. This is my personal favourite, the invasion. I love the way whilst he's used that iconic shot, and he talks in his in his blurb about being reluctant to use the iconic shot of the of the Cybermen yeah. coming down St. Paul's stairs. It's correct. You can't do an invasion cover, I don't think, without using that that, that iconic image. But the fact that he's got all of the other stuff in here as well, a beautiful rendition. And there are Harken, harkens back to the 10th Planet artwork a little as well. There's yeah, yeah, you're about right. About it. Yeah, so it's, it, that just feels all all right to me. Um, so so, and I love again the rendition that they've done of the of the mock up with again a black logo. It all just it it all feels correct. Um, and there are a couple of other new pieces in here. He's done an Inferno cover and he's done a Brain of Morbius cover, which I'm not going to show you. You've got to buy the book. You've got to buy the book to see to see it's the other two, uh, yeah. two brand new pieces in there. But as I mentioned earlier, you get um, you you get. Uh, some of the new series stuff that he that he did for SFX magazine. Yeah, so those are all in there as well. Um, and again, they're beautiful renditions. And then we come into the into as I say these memories. One here from John Colshaw. We get a memory here from John Colshaw. Uh, some cracking cracking mementos, uh, memories that people bring into this. Um, so you know what can you say? That that's a sort of a run through of the book. Even the back cover's gorgeous, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. A beautiful rendition again of the Axos. Um, a clean piece of artwork without without the um, they've taken John Pertwee out of this one, so you get a beautiful clean rendition of the Axons in there. Um, 
it's it's just it's it, as I say it's it's the coffee book that every Doctor Who fan needs. Um, I can't I can't praise it enough. If this sounds like we're just endlessly plugging this book, we are. It's fantastic. We, we haven't done absolutely it yet. love it. We love Chris. <laughs> we love it. Candy Jar. We love this artwork. We love Gotta this get book. It. I can't think of a single way in which this book could have been better. I do think it is an essential Doctor Who book. I think it is a perfect piece of merchandise that couldn't be bettered in any way in any conceivable way i think no. i think candy jar have done have done chris proud i think they've done us proud on on the book that we've always wanted yeah. and i wouldn't think twice particularly if you're a fan who was around at the time but really any fan particularly if you're interested you know because there's a lot of creative people out there who are doctor who fans like myself who maybe work in the creative field or have aspirations to work in the creative field and here you get you get a talk through it you get shown through it by an artist with an incredible pedigree an amazing body of work and one who can who is self-effacing and can remember and account and detail his creative choices on the way to that solution to meeting that brief which is invaluable too as any artist will tell you so this this yeah. book works on every conceivable level i you should get it of course you, you should, should get it. Uh, and uh, it and is, if it sounds uh, like we're gushing about Chris Achilles, again, we are gushing about it because he won't gush about his work himself. We are gushing because we really do <laughs> yeah. love it. Phenomenal. Yeah. It's up there, uh, yet we are gushing quite, quite proudly. We're wearing our, our, our hearts yeah. and our sleeves. We love this. Congratulations, Great. Chris, and congratulations, Candy Jar. And uh, yeah, I've, I've really enjoyed talking about it on, on this show. I mean, that is, this is. This is a, a book, this is an inanimate object, and yet it bursts with life. Yeah. And for all the discussions we've had, we've made several videos, haven't we? And had several yeah. conversations across podcasts and videos about target books, about artwork in general. You know, we had that that wonderful uh, interview with Chris himself. Uh, and this is another another entry. It feels like the next step in that journey. And uh, yeah, I, I'm excited to see well, I'm excited to see the pages that I haven't had a chance to sort of feast in all, to take all the information. So, yeah, I'm excited to see as well what the reviews are like out there because I've deliberately not read. I, I don't. It's, it doesn't matter whether it's a film that I haven't seen or a book that I haven't read. I never look at anybody else's reviews. Why do I need to know those? You just need to know mine. Which I, but you, of course, you need to know ours. You sh I hope you've enjoyed watching this video. And please, if you have, please like the video and subscribe to the channel too while you're at it and hit the cluster bell. So you get all our notifications going forward. If you're listening on a podcast, please, yes, uh, hit the hit the subscribe button too and follow us on whichever is the podcast of your choice. If you enjoy the videos, you'd like to see more videos, please let us know. Let us know in the comments section. What's your favorite piece of Chris Akalu's artwork? Which was the first Target book that you owned? And yeah, if you're, if you're going to pick this book up, let us know. Get in touch. Take a picture. Pro prove it. Yeah, we'd love to see. And it's it's really good value as well. You know, the hardback is thirty pounds. Um, that was going to be my next question. Yeah, what's the, the price? What's the price point on the hardback and the paperback for people? Yeah, let's say the hardback is thirty pounds, which is very good value, uh, and the paperback is even better value at fifteen pounds. I think it's about fifteen pounds plus postage. It's not going to cost you a fortune. And don't forget that at the moment, this is exclusively available from Candy Jar Books. You can't get it from any other well-known retailers at the moment. <laughs> uh, yeah. I, I understand it will be coming, but it's a, quite a way down the line. And you don't want to wait. No, so I, 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 I just go to Candy Jar and buy it. it, it, it then these, this is not an expensive book. And you won't be saving that much by waiting a few months and buying it from certain other online retailers. Um, so the only place you can get it is Candy Jar. I think that I think that about covers it, doesn't it? I think we're all we're all done for the time being with Clack. Go and have some tea, and then you can go and look through it again later on. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's <laughs> I finally could just here. And read this book forever. I could just literally just you just want to pour over the pages. It does seem like 1960s, 1970s, 1980s Doctor Who that the story is far from over. And just when you think you've you've uh, had every book that you could ever want on the subject, another one, <laughs> another one turns up. So I'll be keeping an eye on whatever's next from Candy Jar, and uh, yeah, I I think that this this represents. I'm so glad that we've got this book. I, I know that I'm going to go back to it over and over and over again. And you know, I can be a bit I can be a bit OCD about my books. I can want to keep them in pristine condition. As if 
what do I think I'm going to do with them? You know, really, these things should be enjoyed. They should be, if you need to break the spine, break the spine or whatever, just enjoy every page and, and, and sort of take it all in. And I can't be the only one who's got these sort of weird rituals with, with books and all sorts of things like that. I think it's quite We're cool. all the same, Dan. We're Doctor yeah, Who yeah, fans. Yeah. We're all the same. We all work in Christian <laughs> condition. But the beauty of this book is it because it is it is such a quality publication, you won't need to break the spine. You won't need to damage it at all. It's it, it, it's it's a robust book. Um, it, it'll stay in good condition, I think, for many years, however much you pour over the pages. And that's about all we've got time for on this Type 40. Uh, I'll be back some. Uh, I'll be back soon with another Type 40. Look out for that wherever you found this, in whichever form, whether it's as a video or a podcast. It could be you may find us on the dedicated home feed for Type 40, type40.podbean.com. That's where that is. Yes, uh, the the uh, long-awaited type 40 dedicated feed after all this time it's finally there for you so what's so where else can you find us yes we're on uh, apple podcasts of course spotify stitcher iHeartRadio, radio tune in google play pretty much whatever the podcatcher of your choice is you can find us with just a tap or two away there and we're also on the podbean app itself i always find that so easy to use You'll find that in the uh, in the app store of course you can we're also on youtube here the world's largest streaming streaming platform on the Facebook youtube channel plus all our regular shows we're still on that fabulous fandom podcast network's master feed which is loaded up with all those other treats for your ears yeah as i said earlier on maybe you want to have your say about this subject about the the work of chris akaleos about target books about candy jar books or about books in general and about artwork, share whatever is your favourite piece, compare notes with us. Uh, you can do that in the comments section or get in touch with us through our social media, Instagram and Twitter, at type 40 Doctor Who, or you can even email us, type 40. <laughs> or you can, email, email, you can even email us, type 40 Doctor Who, at gmail.com. When I can remember the email address, that's a, that's a help, isn't it? And if you're feeling really brave, you can catch up with us in real time over on Facebook in the Type 40 Facebook group. As well as where else, Simon? There's another Facebook group, isn't there, where you you hang out, which is your lair. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I hang out all the time on uh, the Hoonatics on Facebook, so so uh, where I'm the admin on that. So go and find uh, go and find the Hoonatics and uh, get get your fingers going and have a little chat with us there. That's it. Chip in with all the conversations, yeah. And you can find me. I'm on Instagram and Twitter as the Spacebook, where I talk about not just Doctor Who, but all the other extra dimensions out there of geek culture, whatever catches my eye, my imagination, or both. I ramble on about it at every available opportunity. We always have the time. If you have the space here at Type 40, thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. Take care. Bye-bye. <laughs>